the house of God, and we just thank you for the, for the privilege that we do have of coming to a place like this, don't we? And just what a joy it is. Uh, as we begin our service this morning, we're going to be looking primarily in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. You may want to go ahead and mark that in your Bibles. Ephesians chapter 3. And Pastor, we're going to miss you uh, for the time that you're gone. We're praying for your ministry as you're gone. Would you open us in a word of prayer, please, this morning, brother? Amen. For those that may be just coming, uh, maybe this is your first time, we've been looking at the major themes of the Bible, and last week we really looked a little bit at prophecy. Now, obviously you can't cover in 40 minutes all that there is to do with prophecy, but we were trying to set the foundation for the, uh, the accuracy and to the minute points of prophecy that is done through the, through the scriptures, when, when, when God has given a prophecy, or one of the prophets gave it in the past, we talked about how it was fulfilled. Remember that prophecy is literally God's pre-written history. And we want to always remember that prophecy is just as credible and just as important as any other aspects of scripture. So it's real important for us to grasp that. And remember that almost, um, most, most of the time, most, a lot of people will say at least one-fourth if not even one-third of the Bible is actual prophecy. That's a lot of prophecy, isn't it? So that would be over 2,000 uh, to, to two to 3,000 different prophecies in the Bible. We talked a little bit about how accurate that even if we just had eight, as we looked at in a study a while back, we looked at one of the studies that they had done, one of the had done it, and they came up with if you'd taken a silver dollars and scattered them all throughout Texas, over to, you could have them two foot thick. You took a blind man, put a blindfold on him, marked one of them with an X and asked him to find them. That's how, how, how difficult it would be for all eight of those to be an exact prophecy. So we can only imagine with the thousands and thousands that there are in the Word of God, how, uh, how, how much is just a proof text that this truly is the Word of God and it's all to be trusted. That's going to be important as we go in and we start looking at the coming of the saints. And we're going to be looking at that a little later. But this morning we're going to really focus on something else. We're going to really focus on the mystery, where prophecy, of course, is what is pre-written history. Pro, uh, we're going to look at the mystery, which happens to be things that God has literally withheld for his own purpose. And I think these two foundations, to understand prophecy and understand how, how exacting it is, and so we're studying it as we're going forward, that we can understand better what, we're, what we are studying, as well as, as, as God has withheld certain things until certain times. And that's what the mysteries really are. And we, so we've seen this. And we talked about how last week we saw how almost in every case, well, not in every case, but in, in every case with prophecy, we see the very minute details are, are filled out, are done exactly as God said that they would be. Even as we talked about as the dividing of the garments with Jesus at the cross. How insignificant that must have seemed at the time it was written in the Old Testament. Why would that be important? And yet we saw last week how the Bible actually tells us that this was to fulfill the prophecy of what had been given there. Yes, those little details, they're right to the letter of what everything should be, and they will be so in the future. And then we looked at uh, the fact that the Word presents uh, that there's going to be many prophecies that are going to be still future. And at His resurrection, is so clear when He taught this in the Scriptures in Acts 1-6 when it said, when they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the time or the season which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto both me in Jerusalem, and in all Judah, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, 
Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from, from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you, have, as you have seen him go into heaven. You see, we know in this dispensation, no question at all, I think everyone, we can be pretty confident that's here this morning, knows that there is going to be two, we're looking at two different advents of, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. One happened about 2,000 years ago, and now we know that there's going to be a second. They didn't know that in the Old Testament. We know, that, we know that, as we just read, Christ is coming again. We even know how he's going to be coming. First, he's going to come for the church. We know he's come for the church. How does he come for the church? What's the next, what's the next event on, on the prophetic clock? The rapture, isn't it? We're looking for the rapture. It could happen right now, couldn't it? Any moment, any, any point in time. And we know his second coming is going to be with saints to set up his kingdom. And yeah, that reign is going to be for over a thousand years. We know between these two events, many important events are predicted, such as we know there's going to be an emergence of a one-world church. I think we can see even right now what's going on in this day and time. The church is being pushed and pushed and pushed out, and they're going to come up with a church that will probably be acceptable in the world, the world in our world here and then later in all of the world. But that's coming. We know there's going to be a formation of a world government. With a, with, a, with a world dictator. We know that, of course, to be the Antichrist. We also know there's going to be a gigantic war. And that will be underway at the time that Christ comes to set up his kingdom. We call that Armageddon. All of these things are yet future and yet going to be. Now, the next event on the prophetic clock, of course, is the rapture. Christ is going to come for his, for his, for his saints. And this will be a literal event. It's literal. Jesus Christ is literally going to come again, isn't he? Physically, he's going to come again. He's going to come in the clouds. We know that. We also know that in the end time, that, um, which occurs, what occurs after the rapture of the church, uh, there, there's, there's many, many prophecies that are given, both in the Old and New Testament, concerning that time. We also know that Christ would come for his church. But, but this was not revealed, as we just mentioned, in the Old Testament. This is distinctly a New Testament revelation. Now, looking back at the two advents, we want to consider two things. The Old Testament foreview of the coming of the Messiah was in two aspects. First was the rejection and the suffering of the Messiah. We looked a lot at that last week as we looked in Psalm 22. When we looked uh, Psalm 20, I mean Isaiah 22 and is it Psalm 22, Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. But we looked at those two and we saw how we saw how those things take place. But they also talk about a victorious Messiah at the same time. That was pretty hard for anybody to understand. Often we see both aspects of the same passage in such scriptures. And certainly the prophecies themselves were, were perplexing those that had literally written the prophecy. It had been very hard for them to even begin to grasp or really understand how this Messiah could be both of these, both, do both of these things at the same time. We know that today, but they didn't then. But these seemingly con 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 contradictions... But these, these were seemingly contradictions, but we know, again, that's not today. Now, 1 Peter 1.10, it says, Of which salvations the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace which should come unto, unto you. It's amazing. The Bible's sort of telling us here, it says, look, they wrote these things, and then they studied their own writings to try to understand what God had just shown them. And it would go on to say, it goes on to say, uh, it says, uh, it says uh, in, in 1 Peter 1.11, says, Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed, please notice, to whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but who's it revealed to, it tells us, unto us. We have it in this day and time. We understand it today. They couldn't know what it was back then. It wasn't revealed back then. They did minister the things which are, now, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desired to look into. Not only do we see they didn't, but the angels, it's almost as if they were mystified and just in complete awe. They looked over the banisters of heaven down into the world when Jesus Christ came and made his appearance. 
They were in absolute awe that God would set aside the glory that he had in heaven and humble himself to come into the world as he did. You can just imagine the angels as they looked upon these things. And the Bible tells us what a, how, how, how it was so, so mysterious here. But now we see the mystery is solved in 1 Peter 1, 12, and it says, unto whom it was revealed. You see, it wasn't revealed before. It was hidden. It's now revealed to us, the church. And consider carefully what the Scriptures say. First of all, it told us we just saw how, they were, how, they were, how those that had literally written these Scriptures, the prophets, them searched diligently to understand them. They also, we see how, how this mystery would not be revealed until this dispensation, as 1 Peter points out here, that it was not to be known until then, and how even the angels were astounded by that revelation. So we may ask ourselves, what is a mystery in the Bible? You know, when I think of a mystery, I think of a good whodunit. Whodunit. And we enjoy watching those whodunit shows, you know. Maybe it was Mr. Uh, what, the professor that left the knife in the library. I mean, you know, who, who knows? But the whodunit, that's not what a mystery is. That's not what a mystery is in the Bible. A mystery in the Bible is something entirely different. When we look at prophecy, we see something that tells us that we may foreknow something. We know about something that's going to happen in the future. A mystery is just the opposite. It's literally something that has been hidden and wasn't previously known. God did not intend for that to be known until it was his time to reveal that particular truth. And that's what a mystery is. In the New Testament, it is something that had one time been hidden, but now is revealed to God's people. Jesus spoke of, a, spoke of the mystery of the kingdom, for example, in Mark 4.11. At that point, he was revealing it to his disciples. The apostle Paul uses the word mystery literally 21 times in the epistles. In each case, the mystery involves a wonderful declaration of spiritual truth revealed by God through divine inspiration. These are truths that were unknown before. And a mystery is that which was not made known to people in other generations that has now been revealed by the Spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets. In Ephesians 3, 5, it says, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And now, look, now we think about that just a minute. We see that the Bible clearly states here that these things were not to be known until this time, until, it was, until God had chosen this, this time to disclose it. Now, looking at Ephesians 3, uh, 3, 3, it says, How that by the revelation he made known unto me the mystery. This is Paul, of course, as I wrote afore in few words. Whereby, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So we understand that part of the mystery is the mystery of Christ. That the, that the Redeemer, the, the Messiah, was going to come. And the work that he was going to do in the world, which incidentally, that work that he did in the world is all, a lot of that is already pre-told in the, by the prophets in the Old Testament, what his ministry was going to be like, where he was, well, where he was going to be born, what kind of ministry he was going to have, the fact he was going to do parables, uh, even of his death. All of these things were, were already said within the Old Testament. But there's more to Christ because we're, we're going to come into a knowledge of Christ unlike the world has ever been able to have with God on a very personal and, 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 and uh, an intimate relationship with Him. We are a very, you, 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 in a very unique situation. It goes on to say in verse 9, and he, he made all men to see what is this fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible just said he created all things by who? Jesus Christ. Is there any question that Jesus Christ is God? Who created all that is? God. There's no one else that could have done it. And he, very clearly it states that here, that it was Jesus Christ. And then in Ephesians 5.23, we read this as well. And this is really good. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. See, the church was a great mystery. It was unknown before. And for me, the uttermost, and for me, that the, that the utterance 
may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generations, but now is manifest to his saints. Now you see, we know from the word of God that the Messiah was to have two advents. First, the Messiah was to be born in, a, in, 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 in due time to a virgin. And he was to be a, a peer among men. We know that for, from the book of Isaiah. We know that he, that, that, that he would begin his ministry by announcing, by announcing and predicting and saying that the kingdom, and, and predicting the king kingdom. When he said in Matthew 4, 17, it says, From this time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, we, we think about that. That was what, what, that was what, what Jesus had come. He'd come, to, he'd come, and that was what his message was. But it's also, if we remember, the same message that John the Baptist had in, in, uh, in Matthew. We look at Matthew 3.1. It says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching, pre- preaching in the wilderness of Judah, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You see... We want to always remember that the, that, that the kingdom was offered, it was a legitimate offer to the people of Israel. They had an opportunity to receive that kingdom at that time. It was legitimate. However, God knew before the world even was what was going to happen. He knew, though, the rejection. He knew of all these things. We get a lot of what ifs and what if, you know, it would have been like this, and this is how he would have done it and everything else. You know, it's a little bit, I think about that sometimes, I think, well, that's, that's pretty good. But it's really sort of unimportant because God's God. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows all things. He already knows all of those things. It's irrelevant. He knew all this was going to happen, and yet he, he has his divine purpose, and he has his perfect plan that is going to be fulfilled. And that is exactly what, what, what is happening. He knew that they, he knew that he knew he knew the rejection. And when we think about that, that Jesus Christ would still set aside the glory that he had with the Father and come into this world to pay that price for you and I. It's amazing to consider that. A man that had done, even just as a man, that had done nothing but good. He also knew the, how they were going to reject the king and his kingdom. We see the word at hand, and a lot of people think, well, that means it must be real immediate, so it didn't really follow suit. But we really need to understand, does not mean necessarily it was going to, he was going to immediately appear. But rather, that no known or predicted event must, must intervene. At that point in time, there was nothing to really prevent him from coming at that time based upon the scriptures, okay? There would have still have been a way that he would have had to go through the suffering and the, and the death and that sort of thing. But remember, the 40 days afterwards, what happened? There was a resurrection, wasn't there? Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and he, he was around. He, people were seeing him. He was talking. He was teaching. We have about 18 maybe different, different areas where we see where that was taking place. But John said, even in the Word of God, that there's, even the, even the, the world can, can maintain the, all the pages concerning what all that Christ did. But there's enough there for us to understand that this was a reality, that this all really happened. And at that time, Israel could have, could, could, have, could, could have submitted and come and received him. But they refused. We know that. So we know that. In other words, Christ's appearance, appearance to the Jewish, the Christ, in other words, when Christ appeared to the Jewish people, the next thing in the order, order of revelation as it stood should have been the setting up of the divinic king, kingdom and, of course, of, of, of the king himself. Now, of course, in the knowledge of God, yeah, it wasn't yet, it was not, not being yet disclosed. We knew that he was going to be rejected. They were going to reject both the king and the kingdom. God, of course, has foreknowledge. And the knowledge of God laid the long period of, of the mystery form of the kingdom, the worldwide preaching and teaching of the cross, and the outcalling of the church. A very interesting thing happens. God basically now is going to transfer the gospel, the the preaching of the word, the getting out of the gospel into, not Israel now is going to be the carriers, the ones responsible for getting it out there, but now it's going to be the church. That's a great mystery. The church is responsible today for, for, for that.
You know, this was still locked up in the secret councils of, of, of God. In Matthew 13, 10, it says, And when the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see the things which ye have seen. What's he talking about? The things that he has done. The things that he has said. The things that they have very witnessed as Jesus Christ himself has done these things. And, and have seen them not. And hear the things which ye have heard. And have not heard them. You look at the mystery of the gospel of, of, the, of, the, of the mystery of the gospel revealed. In Ephesians 3, the Apostle Paul's reminded us of the enlightenment, the ennoblement, and the enablement that Christians, that all as Christians, we possess today. Do you feel that way today? Do you feel that you've been enlightened? Do you feel that you have, that you have been ennobled? Do you feel that you have been, uh, uh, the, the enablement that you have? Now, that isn't because of me because I'm something real special here. But it is because of the indwelling spirit. It is because if I seek out to truly live the life that God has for me, I can have that kind of life. A life of power. A life of, 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 uh, a, a life of, of knowledge. A life of wisdom. Of, of knowing the things of, of, of him. Of being enlightened. And also the enablement to do the things that God would have me to do. Not because I'm special, not because I'm particularly strong. None of those things will get me through. Now in Ephesians 3, 1, we go back and it says, Paul starts off, he says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. For Paul had been chosen of God to be the steward of, of the revelations given, give, given to him, but it had been very costly for him. When I say costly, let's think about that just a minute. It had been, but only in the worldly standard. I mean, he paid big, big price. Remember who he was. He was an up-and-comer. He was a guy that had both citizenship and Roman, I mean, both, uh, he was both a Jew and he had citizen and Romanship. He was a privileged man of that day. I believe he was probably pretty wealthy. He certainly was of the, uh, uh, he, he was, on, uh, he was uh, uh, going to be a, um, um, a Pharisee. He was, he was, he was on the path of uh, a Pharisee. And all of that, he had all of those things. He's a religious zealot. We know all of these things. He had all of these things. And when he went the way of the Lord, he suffered greatly, didn't he? In many, many ways. You know, he was imprisoned. He was beaten. All kinds of things happened to him. And eventually he was killed. But was that? Was that a big price for a Christian? For one that knows the Lord? I don't think so. I don't think he thinks so. I think we can see that if we look at it. See, Paul staked his life and liberty on them. He would not die. He would die for, for the truths. The, he, thus he was a prisoner because he dared not to proclaim that he, was in the, that he was in chains because of the opposition of the Jews that hated him. He knew all of this. But Paul considered himself, please notice we just read, to be a prisoner of who? Jesus Christ. He didn't think of himself as being a prisoner of the Jews or of Nero. Paul infuriated the Jews when he taught the, that believing Gentiles were full members of God's family. That was really hard for the Jews to accept. That was really, really hard. And that was a real challenge in those days. And, 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 and also as being in, in full fellowship with the saints. You see, the Jewish pride was really stung by this whole thing and the Jewish establishment. Even the Jews that had become Christians still thought that the Gentiles should, should become Jews in order to be Christians. They should join and, and, and become prostate, apostate Jews and, and, and come in and be, become part of, part of, the, uh, part of, part of their, uh, uh, become Jews and then through that, through, through the uh, Jewish religion. They thought that, and then they thought at least they should be regarded at least as second-class citizens in the kingdom. That should be the next thing. I mean, we, we're, we're first. You guys, if we're going to let you guys in, you're going to be second. You see, but Paul wasn't teaching that. He was teaching they were, guess what? They are the same. 
and you are the same as they are at this point in time. Paul thought that God's revelation taught the Gentiles were, Paul taught uh, God's revelation taught, taught that the Gentiles were equal in the body of Christ, whether they be Jew or Gentile. And they disliked the wholehearted acceptance of the Gentiles into the church, as well as being free from all Jewish laws and traditions and customs. Paul was considered literally in that day and age by many to be a little heretic. He was hated by them. You know, but it's interesting. If you look in the Word of God, you don't really see him criticized. And now you'll see him where he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites. He goes on and he talks about them in that light, doesn't he? He talks about them that way. But at the same time, that was because of their position against the Lord. But as far as he personally, they're criticizing him, we don't see him opposing them for that. And I believe part of that was because he knew where they were coming from. For he himself, as we just mentioned, had been very guilty of the same thing earlier in his life. Now in verse 2 we see dispensation. Here, I think the meaning of dispensation, we might even use the word stewardship to kind of help us give a little better thought. Either way. But God entrusted Paul with these great truths. And in Ephesians 3, 3, in Ephesians 3, 3, it says, How that by revelation he made known unto the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Paul tells us he did not receive the gospel from men. Important distinction. He didn't receive that from men. He literally thought through the Old Testament in the light of Calvary. Through the Holy Spirit was revealed the new truths. But it's important for us to also understand that these things that he was learning never actually contradict the Old Testament. Now, they were new revelations that were being brought about in a new dispensation, the dispensation of grace, the dispensation of the church. But they were not the same. They do not necessarily in any way uh, contradict what was previously done. But they do require something. It's important that, they understand that something be done. And that is that we need to understand that we need to rightly divide the Word of God. The Word of God needs to be rightly divided to be rightly understood. This is where a lot of stumbling comes in today within churches and within those that are trying to study a Bible or trying to learn, and they don't know how to rightly divide the Word of God. In Galatians 1.15, it goes on to say, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by His grace, to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them that were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Now we know it was about three years after that he went to Damascus. We don't, we don't really know how long, how exactly long he was in the desert. He took time to go out into the wilderness to be totally alone, where God could reveal these great truths of the mystery of the church, and such things as the great uh, and the and the great dispensation of grace was the other that he would be learning out there, and that the Jews and the Gentiles were both fellow heirs and Christ through faith, and that is that faith and faith alone in Christ that's what's going to save that, that that's how a person is saved. And all that are saved are part of the same body, the body of Christ, the church. They all are the same, whether they be Jew or Gentile. Now, if he, going on to verse 5 now, it says, Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets of the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, and of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ by the Gospels. You see, it was no secret that God intended to bless the Gentiles, just as He had, just as he had blessed the Jews. We read in Romans 15, 9, it says, And that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy, as it is written, he points out, For this cause I will confess to, the, I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto, my, unto thy name. And again he said, Rejoice, ye Gentiles, with his people. And again, 
Praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah saith, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. We see here this verse referring back to the Old Testament about Jesse. Jesse is, and he said, when I say Jesse, who am I talking about? Anybody know? David's dad, right? Isn't that David's dad? Okay. All scripture. And it amazing how it all fits together. That's where we're coming from here. And then in uh, and the verse 13 goes on to say, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace, believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. I like Holy Spirit, but the Holy Ghost is what the Bible says. Wow. This is, a new, this is something new too. In the Old Testament, the Spirit came upon various men, time to come, leave, kind of come and go, when, and, and, and would, invite, would empower men over, over time. But in our dispensation, it's a little different. In our dispensation, the very moment that we receive Jesus Christ, we are immediately what? We're indwelled with the third person of the Trinity, aren't we? We are, by God's grace, at that very moment, we have the indwelling of the Spirit living within, our, within us. The one that wrote the very Word of God is there within us. We are so blessed at this day and time. He's with us at all times, and He can help us to understand the book if we'll come with a, with a sincere heart to ask these things. You know, these promises that the Gentiles were also going to be blessed were often ignored by the, by, the, by the Jews as well. In their study of the Old Testament, what they would you know, uh, bring out in their, in their messages and all that they thought, they just sort of ignored that part of it. And I think it's also no accident that Israel, when you think about where it was located, was connected to Europe, Asia, and Africa. It was the land bridge of that day for the civilized world. What did that mean? You see, God's plan for Israel was they were to be a witness to the world of God. They were his people. God had done the miraculous miracles through them. We think about how he had fought the battles for them, the battles that they knew. Did they fear Israel, these nations? They didn't fear Israel. They feared Israel's God. They knew that God could do all kinds of things. The greatest nation at the time when, uh, 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 when, when Moses was going to lead the people out at that time was Egypt, this big, big, powerful nation that had a tremendous army and these, all of these simple slaves that were going to be taken out, between three to five million of them, as Moses led them out. And then Pharaoh has that change of heart and he comes after them and he's riding in his chariots and he's going full speed and he's coming out there to destroy them this time around with his massive army. God says, Abraham, hold up your rod. Who did I say? Oh, Abraham, oh. Thank you. Moses said, God said to Moses, hold up your rod and I will part the seas. And that's exactly what he did. And all of those slaves, those nobodies, walked across on dry land. The army, they came completely across. There was that pillar of fire that held back the, held, held, held back the, the, the uh, Egyptian army. And then they were allowed. And as they started to come across, God closed it up. Miracle upon miracle, that's just one. We can talk about how God, how God was, was, was working in the lives of, of Israel and the nation of Israel. They could see all of that, and yet they turned their back upon Israel and didn't follow the plan that God had for them. You know, he also reveals they were to be the witness. They were to be a faithful witness to the world of God. And that so the rest of the world could actually learn of him. We know how Israel failed to do this. Also revealed by the Lord to his disciples was the truth about the local, the local and the universal church. Now, how do I say that, local and universal? Well, when we think about the church, we think about, number one, the Bible talks about the body of Christ, doesn't it? What is the body of Christ? It is every believer that has received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They are a member of that body. We're not going to study that this morning, but just so we can kind of get that, that idea, they're all one in this body. And then there's also the physical brick and mortar or destination or place or group 
that is called the local church or the local assembly. It's also very real. But there's a distinct difference. The universal church is only made up of true believers. You must be a true believer. You must be one that's been born again and saved to be in the true church. In a regular church, there can be those that have not received Jesus Christ and still be a part of that assembly. There's a difference. But both are necessary. Certainly we see in the book of, we see when we read about Ephesians and Philippians and all of those different churches, we read about individual churches as well. So they, they, they too were part of all of this. Now we look at Peter's confession, confessing Jesus Christ as Christ. There are many that say, well, you know, Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, that's pretty hard for me to swallow. I mean, it's not like me, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him and for Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. Uh, who is that? Jesus Christ, isn't it? It's got to be Jesus Christ. And we know that, and yet, I don't know how else you can say that. He made all things. But in Matthew 16, 13, goes on to say, when Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea, uh, Caesarea Philippi, He asked the disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Vajarna, uh, or Jonah. For flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. You know, Jesus was first also to teach the Paulinian, we, we often call it the, the, the Paulinian concept of being in Christ. I love that. I love that. And you don't hear it oftentimes, but it's so true. In Christ, isn't that a wonderful thing to hear? If you're here this morning as a child of God, you are in Christ. We're in Christ, so just, to, just that very thought. In John 15, 3, it says, Now you're, the, you, you're, clean, uh, you're clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. And notice what Jesus says. This is what Jesus, Jesus is saying these things. He says, Abide in me, and I, what? In you, right? As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except that it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. We see the Lord talking about himself and being in him. In Ephesians now, verse 6 goes on there. We see it says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of the same promise in Christ by, by the gospel. This new equality for the Gentiles was hard, as we've already mentioned, for most Jews. The truth that the Jews and the Gentiles were the same body and enjoyed the same privileges was hard for them to accept. But what was even harder was that the Gentiles were not even going to be added to the existing corporation of the body of the Jewish people. Here they, you know, wow, this is hard enough to accept this, but guess what? They aren't even going to be part with what we're at. Remember, the traditions, all those things, they, they, weren't, they weren't doing any of that at all but that there was going to be an entirely new body of which the Jews and the Gentiles would be added on equal terms. That's where we are today, my friends. Whether you be Jew, whether you be Gentile, today we basically have two classes of people. We have the saved and we have the unsaved. That's where we're at. Now, God's going to deal with Israel at a different time. We all know that. But in this time, in this dispensation, that's where we're at. There's only two ways. You either are or you aren't. Whether you be Jew or Gentile, 
It's very hard for the Jews that we read about in John and some of the other epistles that talks about the difficulty that they have. But still, there's only two ways, and the same opportunity exists in both. The Jews and the Gentiles would be fellow heirs. There would be no double portion for the Jews, as they had really thought that there should be. The Jews and the Gentiles alike would receive the same blessings, and there was to be only one body. And this one body would be made up of all that are a part of the church. And its head was to be Jesus Christ. All believers, whether Jews or Gentiles, were all one in Him. They were all to be washed in His blood, part of their salvation. All partakers of the same spiritual life, and all equally depend upon Him. And here's the other part of that, on one another. As a child of God, we should be depending upon one another as well, shouldn't we? But our main, main is dependent upon our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jews and Gentiles would also share the same life in Christ. There was no longer any special promises made to the Jews. The full good news of the New Testament truth was the property of the church now, and not so much Israel. It was, well, basically not even Israel at this point. And it would be the church that would bring forth and go into all the world and proclaim the gospel now. In verse 7 of Ephesians, it goes on to say, Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Paul fully realized, Paul, Paul fully realized in the revelation of truth that he, he received, that he received. These were gifts of God, of God's marvelous grace. And that his insights were certainly not generated by strength of his own intelligence. They were just one more evidence of God's mighty power working in him. God's grace and power are at work today in all members of us. Everyone's a member of the body of Christ. With a brother, when a brother's gift is as an evangelist, we see the Holy Spirit working. People are convicted. Souls are saved. When a brother has the gift of being an expositor, an expositor uh, basically a teacher or a, or a pastor, he can open up the wonders of the word, word so that people are blessed and enriched by his ministry. When a brother is a successful administrator, he's known how, he knows how to organize and help the church to grow and to keep it in, a, in, 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 a, in the right uh, and to keep everything in line and keep it in the right, uh, in the right, uh, uh, I can't think of the right word I'm looking for here this morning, but basically neat and tidy, the way it should be, no, not, not, not any waste, but, but, but as God would have it in a perfect order. A sister is a true mother. Her home is a, is a heaven for her family uh, and a lighthouse for her neighbors. Her children call her blessed. Other women call her a true friend. In business, people note a sense of God's presence when dealing with her. Her husband is blessed. Her church feels the impact of her prayers. And God's grace and power are at work in her life. You see, God's grace and power should be at work in every child of God. Every one of us here this morning has a ministry of one type or another. Some people think if you're not a pastor, if you're not a teacher, if you're not a if you're not an evangelist, if you're not doing this, if you're not out on a mission field, if you're not doing these things, are you, you, you know, that, that they, all these things are for them. But the Bible teaches us that being a father, being a mother, even being a child, being an employer, being an employee, all of these are ministries, all of these are outreaches, and all of us have the responsibility of being in tune to the opportunities that are opened up to us and being able to share the gospel with others. There's people that we can talk to that nobody else can. Neighbors, such as the pastor was talking about this morning, his next door neighbors, he's had a chance over the years to, to really get to know and kind of spread that out. These are all so important. He goes on to say in verse 8, he says, Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Unto me who am least among all the saints, he says. This is just a Paul basically guarding against the unnatural tendency or the natural tendency of pride. <clears throat> All gifts are of God and not of ourself. In, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 9, it says, For I, Paul, Paul speaking, 
for I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be a called an apostle because I persecute the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace, which was, which was bestowed upon me, me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but I, but, but the grace of God, which is in me. We're going to go ahead and stop there this morning. But what I would like us to see here this morning is when Paul says this, this statement here, I want to close with this statement. He says, he says, uh, but I am, yet I, I am what I am. My friends, you are what you are. There's people smarter than you. There's people faster than you. There's people that have this, they have this, they have that. They're taller than you. They're shorter than you. Whatever it happens to be, there's so many different things we can look at and say, well, if only I was like them. If only I had what they had. If only I were like this. But in each one of us, God has a uniqueness. There's a uniqueness about each and every one. A uniqueness in our particular walk with the Lord. Remember, God is God, and so therefore, His purpose in our life is a perfect purpose. We are not just here because we don't know. We're... We're here because God knows the very time we're in, the circumstances that are in the world, all the things that are going on, he knew that we would be here and we'd be a part of this. And we can be confident that he's going to lead God and direct our steps if we'll simply let him do that. Okay, with that said, we'll go ahead and close. And Norm, would you close this morning, please, brother?